Hello everyone, this is Professor Sexton with a video lecture on scene one of Disgrace, the play that we are starting to read. Uh, first of all, let me just say a little information about plays in general. Um, by and large, plays are meant to be seen and not read. Um, so most often when a playwright writes a play, uh, the intention of that playwright is that this is going to be performed. Uh, and when a play is performed, there's a lot that goes into how an audience experience that play. Uh, a lot depends on who is chosen as the actors to play particular roles, um, because whoever is playing that role affects the way that we experience the play. Um, a lot is uh, dependent on setting, um, because what plays, um, plays can be set very differently. Um, sometimes um, the setting is very minimalist, where there's not a lot of stuff on the stage. Um, like, for instance, Shakespeare's earlier plays had very little background setting. Uh, normally, you just hide the actors on a stage uh, with very little props. Um, but then some other plays can be very elaborate uh, in terms of setting, uh, in the stage setting. Uh, like, for instance, if a play is set in an apartment, um, the stage director could go into a lot of detail about putting in couches and chairs and tables and things of that nature. Um, and so when you're seeing a play perform, you have all of that visual, um, those visual cues there in front of you, if that's what the playwright has done. Um, sometimes you don't, so it just depends. Um, a lot about plays also depends on the audience around you. Because when you see a play being performed, you're not experiencing that play in isolation. Like, for instance, when you read a play, you're experiencing that in isolation. It's just you and the words on the page. However, when you're seeing a play perform, there are other people in that theater. They could be people that you've come with, or they could just be other people that, are, that happen to be there. And audiences react. So something can happen on stage, and everybody in the audience can gasp at the same time. And that affects your experience of that play. So when we read a play, a lot of those things are not there. Uh, and so reading a play is very different than seeing a play perform. Um, oftentimes, playwrights give some background information. Like, so for instance, in Actor's Disgrace, there's a page where he describes the setting of the play. Um, this information is usually in italics. Uh, it's very important to read that information uh, because my belief is that if an author puts something in to a literary work, she or he is doing it for a reason. And it affects the way that we experience the work. So when you're reading this play of disgrace, make sure that you pay attention to all of that as well. And the last thing that I want to say about a play, which is very different than a lot of other literary genres, is that a play depends largely on dialogue. Um, so like, for instance, when you're reading a short story or you're reading a novel, oftentimes the author of a short story or a novel can tell you what a character is thinking inside her head, that author can give you background information about a character and what his childhood was like and how his childhood experience uh, influences the way that he thinks and sees the world. A play doesn't do that. Um, a play is spoken. And so most of the information that you're going to get when you read a play is from the actual words that are said. And one of the differences as well in reading a play as to seeing one perform is that sometimes you don't know how things are said. Like, for instance, if I said, like, oh, it's raining again, or I said, oh, it's raining again, the different tones there affects the way you experience that statement. However, when you're reading the words on the page, that tone may not always be clear. Uh, now, sometimes uh, with the use of punctuation marks, um, it can give you a sense. Like if there's an exclamation point, um, then that tells you um, that this is said in a loud voice, most likely. 
sometimes a playwright might put into parentheses um, a vocal cue. Um, like for instance, if a character is a mirror and then in parentheses says angrily, that tells you that that's said angrily. But some playwrights do that a lot. Some do it very little. So you don't have that information or you may or may not have that information. So there's a lot of interpretation there. Um, when you see a play performed and you're looking at the actors performing the play, you can see their facial expressions and how they react to one another. You don't see that when you're reading a play. So in reading a play, we are at some disadvantages. There are things there that we just don't have. Does that mean that we should not read a play? And does that mean that we still cannot get the full intent of a play? No, it does not. It just requires a little bit more on us and a little bit more careful reading. Now, let me say something about I Heart Actar's disgrace. In this play, there are some triggering scenes and some triggering actions. There are things that characters say that are not, you know, they're, 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 they're horrible and they're, they're awful. And there are things that some characters do um, that will make us angry. Um, the thing that I want you to remember is that this is a work of fiction. And also that when a character says something about a particular group of people, that is not what the playwright believes. That is the playwright delving into a particular character. And so what you have to do is read this carefully. Don't make assumptions that what happens in this play is speaking for everybody. Don't make assumptions that what the playwright is revealing is his or her personal beliefs. Uh, I happen to know for a fact that with I Heard Actar, the main character of Ramir says a lot of things that Actar himself disagrees with. Uh, I only know this because I've read interviews um, that Actar has done on this play, um, and I would not have known that any other way. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail um, about uh, this play uh, in these video lectures. Um, so a lot of this is going to depend upon your own reading. But the thing that I do want you to keep in mind as you're reading scene one, the setting. So this is set in late summer 2011. And what you need to know is that historically, this is 10 years after 9-11. So 9-11 happened September 11, 2001. Yes. Uh, and so this is 10 years after that. Um, the setting is a spacious apartment in the Upper East Side on New York City. Being set in the Upper East Side of New York City already tells you something about the people who live in this apartment. Because think of the associations that you have with the Upper East Side. Um, we tend to think of the Upper East Side as wealthy and as expensive. So that already tells you something as well. Uh, in the first part of scene one, Actar does a lot by setting the stage. So he gives you a sense of what this apartment looks like. Um, you know, the apartment has high ceilings, um, crown molding, the works, um, you know, it's well furnished, there's Islamic art, um, there's bottles of alcohol. Um, and so there's, there's this, this, all of this stuff is very important to know. Um, and then he gives you a description of the two characters. So in the first scene, there are three characters. There's Emily. Um, and Emily is described as in her early 30s, white, uh, lovely. And then there's Amir, who's 40, and he's of South Asian origins in an Italian suit jacket and a crisp collar shirt, but only boxers underneath. And he speaks with a perfect American accent. Emily and Amir are a married couple. In the opening scene, what um, Emily is doing is she's painting a picture of Amir, but she's painting it in the style of an earlier picture by an author named Vasquez. And Vasquez is uh, painting a picture of his assistant, a guy named Juan. And, and there's some controversy between Amir and uh, Emily about Juan's relationship to Vasquez. So, Vasquez was a painter. 
Juan was Vasquez's slave, who later became his assistant and actually became a painting painter in himself. Amir finds it odd that his wife wants to paint him in the style of someone who was a slave. And he kind of says, you know, you know, I find this very weird. But he also find it weird that there was an incident the night before at a restaurant and it was described as a racist incident. Now, we don't get the exact details of it because once again, we're getting this from Amir and Emily talking about it. And Emily says, he was, he, he was, he was a dick to you. Um, and she says, looking at you, and Amir corrects us, looking at us. And it's a very interesting thing because Emily seems to express that the only reason that the race, the radio was uh, uh, was racist, was because of Amir's South Asian origins. But when Amir says, "Looking at us," Amir kind of hints at the fact that really what was behind it was because he was South Asian and he was with a white woman. Uh, now, this is not said verbatim or directly in the play, so this is my interpretation. Uh, you might interpret this differently, which is totally fine. Um, because keep in mind with literary work, there's no right or wrong interpretation. They're just stronger ones and not so strong. So you'll have to look at textual information to support your reading. Um, after this, Amir and Emily goes into like Amir sees one as a slave and Emily says he was an assistant. And Emily's argument is that Vasquez painted a lot of pictures of kings and queens or, you know, people of high blood. But her belief is that those paintings weren't as nuanced. And she believes that Vasquez's painting of Juan is more nuanced and more detailed. And so one of the reasons why she's painting a mirror in this way is that she's painting a mirror in a way that she sees a mirror. Uh, she says to him, and she's talking about the waiter, not seeing you, not seeing who you really are, not until you started to deal with him. And so the way she's painting this painting is in the sense that she's trying to show Amir that this is the way that she sees him, that he's more detailed, more nuanced uh, than what that waiter saw. But the thing is, Amir sees it differently. So one of the things that this play deals with right off the bat is how different people have different perspectives on scenes and incidents in our life and how well they are able to communicate those different perspectives to others. It also is a play that deals with lived experiences. Emily as a white woman does not have the same experiences that Amir as a South Asian man living in New York City and post 9-11 would have. Um, after 9-11 happened, there was a lot of anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic sentiment uh, brought to the forefront um, in American society. And as we saw just recently, um, that that came back, you know, and I wouldn't even say it came back. I'm going to say that it never, it never actually left. It was just always there waiting for an opportunity to resurface. So Amir, understands this at a very different level than Emily understands it. Um, and so you see that as well there. There's also a part of this play, which for a long time, I didn't quite understand why it was there. But there's a scene like on two, two pages of it, uh, where Amir is dealing with work related issues. And Amir is a high powered lawyer at a very prestigious law firm. And there's like two pages of him talking first to a client and then to a paralegal. And for a number of years, whenever I read the scene, I was thinking to myself, why is this here? I, I, don't, I don't know why this is important. But then it just occurred to me this year as I was rereading the play that what it does is it shows Amir's power and control and his dominance and how he sees himself. And then one of the other issues about this play is about perception. Um, and Amir has one view of himself. And I think one of the struggles that Amir has consistently is he has a view of himself, yet other people have a view of him. And so it's always about him trying to manage 
how he's seen and how he's viewed. And when I started to think about that, it made me think that perhaps one of the reasons why he is so upset with Emily doing this painting of him, because Emily as the painter is now in control of the image, right? Because she's the one with the paintbrush, she's the one with the canvas. And so by her being with the paintbrush in the canvas, she's setting the image and he's not setting the image. And so I think that this is one of those things that he's struggling with. Uh, here when this uh, painting comes up. And also, let me just add to in course document, there is a picture of the Vasquez painting that Emily is using as one to paint a mirror. So the, that painting is not a mirror. It's the Vasquez painting of Juan. And so Emily, when she's painting a mirror, she's painting him in that same style. So you, you have it as an image so you can take a look at it. Um, so you have that. Then another thing that happens is this. This scene is interrupted by Abe. Abe is Amir's nephew. Now, Abe's real name is Hussein, but Abe has changed his name to Abe Jensen. And this is a very interesting part in the play because Abe has changed his name. And I'm going to call him Abe because that's just the way he's listed in the play. He's changed his name. And Amir, who is his uncle, is, re refuses to call him a Jensen. He still calls him Hussein. And it's a point of controversy uh, between Abe and Amir because Abe says, you know, kind of like, come on, uncle, I've changed my name to Abe Jensen. Can you please call me that? And Amir said, I'm not going to call you that. That's not how I know you. Uh, and the thing that becomes very interesting here is that Amir has also changed his name. And it's actually Emily who calls him out on it. She says, Amir, you changed your name too, which almost makes it seem like Amir is a hypocrite because Amir has changed his name, yet he's unwilling to accept the fact that his nephew has changed his name. And Amir has changed his last name. So Amir's first name has always been Amir. That's the name that he was born with. But he changed his last name to Kapoor, which is a less, which is not distinctly a Muslim name. You know, um, I mean, I'm sorry. He changed his name to Kapoor, you know, uh, which, you know, can be Hindi. You know, there's, there, there, there's some flexibility in what that name signifies. So in a lot of ways, Amir changes his last name for actually almost the same reason why Abe is changing his name. And it just brings up this issue. It's like, why, why has Amir changed his name? And he's so unwilling to recognize that his nephew has changed his name. Uh, the, the issue is not really directly handled here. So once again, this is, a, this is something that we have to interpret. Um, we do also see as the scene unfolds that Amir has a lot of issues with his religion. So Amir grew up in a Muslim household and he grew up as a Muslim. But as he got older, he has denounced his faith and no longer practices. As a matter of fact, does a lot of things that goes against the tenets of um, Islam. Um, he drinks, he eats pork, uh, he does all of those things. And so what you see with Amir is, Amir is a man who struggles with his identity. This is what we also saw with the painting of Emily, uh, the painting that Emily does. Um, Amir has a lot of issues with his religion, just, just a whole lot. And this is what I was kind of talking about at the very beginning. Amir says a lot of negative things about Islam. Um, and the thing that you got to keep in mind, this is not Agtar's criticism. This is Amir, and this is Amir's emotions and feelings that he is expressing here. Um, and so you can't read what Amir says as truth because it's not truth, it's his experiences um, and it's his perspective. And as we all know, a person's perspectives can be wrong. Um, Amir recounts this time that when he was growing up that he had a crush on this girl named Rifka. And Rifka and he used to pass notes to one another at school. And one day he came home and he had a note from Rifka 
And he talks about this time where his mother saw the note and asked him, is that a Jewish name? And he, and he said, first of all, he said, no. And his mom said, I know a Jewish name. And she said, you know, over my dead body, will you ever be with a Jewish person? And then she spat on him. Then Amir says, like the next day when he went to school, he saw Rivka and he asked her if she was Jewish. And when she said yes, he spat on her. This is a very interesting scene in this play because I, I struggle with this scene because sometimes I wonder if this really happened. Now, keep in mind, this is a play. Um, there's no way I can fact check this. And this is fictional characters. But I always ask myself what he had done that. Um, at the time of this incident, Amir is in the fifth grade, around, around the fifth grade. And, you know, I was having this conversation with other students uh, in an in-person class. And what we came up with is that at that, at that age, we often emulate what we see our parents do. I mean, you know, at a very young age, whatever we see in the home is what we also do. And then also at that age, in terms of the fifth grade, we're still trying to figure out ourselves. So it is quite possible that Amir did do this in the fifth grade, but it's also possible that he's fabricating this to prove his point. Because one of the things that you want to think about too is you want to think about memory. Memory is not the same thing as historical fact. Memory is how, and I'm going to use the word to explain the word, memory is how we remember something. But just because we remember something in a particular way doesn't mean that that's actually the way that it happened. Uh, like, for instance, uh, I am the oldest of five. And so, I, you know, there's five of us. Oftentimes, when my siblings are together, we talk about past family incidents. And it's interesting because when we're talking, the five of us together, one of us might have a different perspective of that incident than someone else. So, you know, like my sister Amanda might say, you know, yeah, and dad was so angry. I'd be like, no, he wasn't angry at all. And so here's the deal. He, my, my sister Amanda and I were both there. But in her viewpoint, she saw dad as being angry. In my viewpoint, I didn't see him as being angry. So once again, this is how memory plays into effect. You know, like two people can say, see the, the same accident. And then when you start to ask them what happened, they all have different narratives on that. And so this is also the thing about Amir as well. Um, so when Amir tells this story, you know, I'm thinking this is either how he experienced it and this is how he remembers it. Or this is how it really happened. And then the question that you have to ask yourself is, does it really matter if it actually happened this way or not? Uh, and my argument will be probably not, because regardless if it happened that way or not, it has some effect on him uh, and probably explains why he kind of turns his back on his religion. The last thing that happens in scene one is the reason why Abe has come to the house is Abe goes to a mosque. And the Amman there at the mosque has been arrested because there are allegations that the Amman has been supporting a terrorist organization. And because Amir is an attorney, Abe wants his uncle to not be the Amman's attorney, but to at least consult and be on the Amman's legal defense team. Amir, given his relationship with his religion, is reluctant to do so, and he doesn't want to do so, um, but he does. And Emily kind of pushes it, which is very, which is also very interesting because Emily is very pro-Islamic. Um, you know, she studies Islamic art. Um, she's read the Quran. Um, she she sees the beauty in this, and Amir does not. Uh, matter of fact, Amir fights it at every turn, yet Emily pushes him. And it's also a really interesting question, too, because it almost reads as if Emily is trying to make Amir into what she wants him to be. Now, once again, this is an interpretation. You know, you might read that differently. Um, so when you're reading scene one of this play, Look at all of those things. Look at what Amir says. Look at what Emily says. Look at what Abe says. Um, what is it that you see as the main point of that first scene? I can tell you that the first scene is setting up a lot of things that are going to kind of collapse as the play progresses. 
Um, so uh, I know there's so much, much, much more that we could talk about in terms of scene one. And as I said before, this is a discussion that would work better if we were either in person or synchronous. Um, so there are some limitations to even doing it this way. Uh, but, you know, as I said before, what I've offered you here in scene one is a lot of my interpretations. Uh, you might read these things differently, and that is totally fine. So if you see Amir operating differently, you see Emily operating differently, you see Abe operating differently, that's totally fine. As long as you can go back to the text and say, hey, Professor Sexton, I don't think that your interpretation of Amir is exactly right. What I see is Amir is doing this. I said, like, okay, but show me how you got there. You know, and as long as you can show me how you got there, that's totally fine. So I hope that this works as an, kind of like an introductory to um, scene one. I hope you do enjoy the play Disgrace. Um, it is a hard play. It deals with some tough issues. There are things that are said and done in the play that are horrific, things that I disagree with on a personal basis. But I think that what Actar does really well in this play he deals with that search for identity. He deals with the way how society can often makes us feel ostracized from our religion, um, from who, how we see ourselves, how our family sees ourselves, how our family sees us and things of that nature. So he deals with some very powerful issues here and I think he does it exceptionally well. So I hope that all of you are doing well and I look forward to seeing you in the next video lecture on uh, Disgrace. All right, have a good one. Bye.